This episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 21st of August 2024 at home in Wicklow. And it is something of a nostalgia trip. It's also something of an analysis of nostalgia and its its usefulness or not. It's also an indictment of a certain type of regurgitated nostalgia that proliferates on social media. Uh, ultimately, my position is give me your specific, your specific nostalgia. Give me your specific bittersweet memory. Give me your specific romanticized reminiscence. Don't give me the generalized rubbish. It has no value. Um, I wish I said it as succinctly as that in the, the main body of the episode, but uh, I didn't. Uh, one thing you have to look forward to is my holding up of three untouchable comedy classics of of my childhood. <laughs> and that's in the context of nostalgia. And it's also in the context of my daughter not wanting anything to do with them. Uh, you can see if you agree with me or not. So that's what's coming up. Um, and this was recorded uh, on a pretty stormy night. So there was definitely a sense of me hunkering down in my bunker. Maybe hashtag bunker. Maybe it doesn't sound very appealing, does it? Uh, anyway, you can listen. I'll be with you right around the corner. I'll see you there. Cheers. Ooh, not gonna change my mind. Leaving the dream behind. Keep my mojo inside. Hi, my name is Dara Clear, and you're listening to the Clear Out. How are you? Thank you for joining me. Thank you for choosing to listen to this podcast. I am so happy to have your company right now <laughs> because I'm sitting in a dark shed illuminated only by a candle and the light from my, my laptop. And even though I was told the east coast of Ireland wasn't going to be that badly affected, <laughs> the, uh, the tail end of Hurricane Ernesto, I believe, which reports assured me would be most damaging on the west coast, which is very far from where I sit. But um, there have been some serious <laughs> gusts of wind as I sit here in my little my little shed. Hashtag shed. Hashtag small shed. <laughs> uh, and. Um, yeah, the effect is the effect is spooky. And funnily enough, what it reminds me of is this time of year. It's, it's um, my father's birthday in a few days. And I remember around his birthday. Wow. Um, let me think. Was it 1986 or 1987 that Hurricane Charlie landed? in Ireland and it hit a lot of damage and it led to the the collapse of a bridge just down the road from um, my family home which was about as dramatic as it got um, but I remember in the lead up to Hurricane Charlie being in a pub with my parents and other friends my brother had started secondary school at that stage and one of his secondary school friends was down and I thought he was a very cool guy. I was very impressed. He was funny and friendly, a little bit crazy. And I just remember being in that pub and I f you know, my memory, whether I, probably, you know, I may have conflated this as, as one does with memories. But I felt like the, the beginnings of the, the hurricane were were making their presence felt outside, like gusty and you know grey skies and rainy. But we were all cosy in the pub and it was 
you know, I, I found myself in different pubs as a child. This was definitely one of the nicer pubs down down our way, down Wicklow way. Um, and something about it felt okay. This is this is not this is not the norm, and it felt like a, a special occasion. So I was I was just kind of recollecting that um, to to. to <laughs> to add to the, um, the the sense of the sense of vulnerability in that particular hurricane, um, which is either, as I say, thirty, um, you know, thirty eight or, or thirty seven years ago now. Um, I think it must have been thirty eight years ago. I don't think it was thirteen. Anyway, the um, we were living in a mobile home at the time because. My father and various others were building our house, so a mobile home is is it's not the the greatest place to be when a hurricane um, you know starts to uh, throw you about the place. Anyway, the mobile that mobile actually you know the mobile survived that hurricane. That mobile's long gone. Another mobile sits where it sat more or less. So, um, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. You may or may not hear the wind um, because if you've caught the last couple of episodes, I have mentioned how this little shed studio isn't particularly soundproofed. It's not insulated at all. That's going to become an issue um, as, as autumn really settles in. But um, keep your ears peeled, because um, I can see on the on the monitor. I can see when the the, the mic is picking up the, the the sounds outside. So there you go. Anyway, now what do I want to talk about apart from past and present hurricanes, from Charlie to Ernesto? Well, funnily enough. Maybe because I was thinking along those lines, um, I was reflecting on what age my daughter is now and what her experience of this summer is. She's at a friend's house uh, as I record this. I'm recording this at night and she's been at a friend's birthday party all day. So she's um, bringing her summer holidays to a, a nice conclusion with a few little things like that. Um, but I was, yeah, I was trying to, do you know what I was thinking about? I'll tell you exactly what I was thinking about. This little shed, <laughs> this little shed and its sort of smallness and its, its creakiness and its, um, its not very evident robustness. Um, and the fact that noises can be heard outside the shed and this has informed my my ongoing um, a- attempt to to try and rename where we're living um, because we, we moved out of hashtag blessed and now I'm trying to go yeah as I said this is hashtag shed hashtag small shed um, but I, do you know what I was thinking of? I was thinking of Elwood Blues in the Blues Brothers and his tiny, extreme, you know, comically narrow and comically small apartment um, into which he... Is, no, he doesn't... Carrie Fisher doesn't end up in there, does she, in the apartment? But Jake, his brother, who's just got out of... Um, just got out of Folsom prison. Um, he brings him there, and it's right beside or beneath the, the, the train track. And every time a train goes over, everything just you know is 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 shaken you know to an inch of its life. And uh, Elwood, played by Danny Aykroyd, just kind of deadpans goes, "Well, it ain't much, but it's home." Um, 
And so I, I, I was wondering, perhaps I should, I should refer to. It, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fair to refer to the house, which is, is you know where we've ended up is lovely, but maybe the shed. Um, I should refer to and, and the recording studio and therefore the podcast, as hashtag, hashtag Elwood's place. It might be too, um, that might be too cryptic a reference. And I was thinking about the Blues Brothers, and I was thinking that it was probably one of a a triumvirate of comedy films that my my older brother and myself and my friends loved as as kids um so i was just kind of i was trying to think what other movies might threaten this 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 holy trinity of comedy classics but the films I was thinking of were the Blues Brothers, um, the Great Race, uh, Blake Blake Edwards uh, comedy with um, Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon as rival sort of r- rival adventurers and daredevils, sort of in the um, uh, the what was the cartoon with Dastardly and Mutley and is it Pippi Longstockings um, something races was that what it was called I can't even I, I, I don't think it was on Irish TV or if it was I never saw it but it was in that kind of mode very 60s Natalie Wood of course was in that as well um, and Peter uh, Peter Falk as Jack Lemmon's sidekick we thought The Great Race was fantastic like brilliant <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll come back to that in a second and the third one of course was Blazing Saddles uh, Mel Brooks's Blazing Saddles with Gene Wilder and Cleveland Little um, and I'm not sure those three films could have been improved upon in to our minds and I don't think there was another comedy um, or caper movie or spoof that threatened those three Um and like I'm sitting here trying to think and I mean the only other movie that you know I'm thinking of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory again with Gene Wilder but I mean that wasn't really a comedy as such you know musical children's movie obviously based on the Roald Dahl book and had the thrill of sort of Gene Wilder's um, ambiguous kind of performance you know slippery and sort of melancholy and not quite manic not the, not the mania he used to bring to the, the Richard Pryor movies he did later um, Charlie and the Chocolate F- Factory was a, a, a perennial favourite around Christmas time but those other three occupied a different space um, they just felt enormously well funny of course but like sort of anarchic um, a little bit transgressive you know but genuinely entertaining um, yeah and I was just thinking about I was trying to put the, the movies into the context of nostalgia and sentimentality um, and I did. If you go back, go back to the uh, the early episodes of the podcast. I did an episode on nostalgia, and tried to understand it um, and understand the kind of the function of nostalgia and what it does for us. And I offered a sort of a critique of nostalgia then, um, and I, I want to sort of expand on that. Um, I'll expand on that momentarily again. I, I kind of I, I want to sort of revisit the idea of nostalgia and contextualize it. Um, you know, contextualize it within a sort of a, a wellness frame or within a sort of a personal excavation frame, and also within a, a social media frame. But but before I do that. A few years ago, I tried to um, I tried to introduce the Great Race to my daughter, 
um, who was would have been about seven then, and she lasted about oof, five minutes, ten minutes, and she just she just thought it was terrible. She had no interest at all, <laughs> and I was like, "But but but it's the great race." <laughs> <laughs> this is this is funny stuff and I mean it is dated there's no two ways about it it is dated it is very 60s and of course the issue is one of the main issues is it's pacing so many movies you go back and you think wow they were a laugh riot and the pacing of the set pieces and, and the gags and the humour is so slow um Compared to, you know, compared to what, what kids are used to nowadays and compared to, you know, what, you know, any sort of comedy film you'd see nowadays. Um, and it's it's something to behold. Now, I haven't revisited. Um, I haven't revisited Blazing Saddles in a very long time. And I feel like I have seen bits of the Blues Brothers more recently. And, um, you know, the Blues Brothers isn't a small it isn't it isn't a short film um of course the blues brothers was you know um part of the enjoyment of the blues brothers also was this sort of soul revival aspect to it like it was as i said the blues brothers was 1980 and to see the likes of um you know ray charles uh john lee hooker's in it isn't he aretha of course um james brown um and others cab calloway um you know there was something you know as a kid i mean i would have been whatever six or seven watching the blues brothers for the first time and i i i would have known who aretha franklin was i don't think i knew who james brown was at that stage maybe i did but there was something so um unmistakably cool and brilliant uh, about those performers um on the on that on that kind of like you know back end of of you know peak soul and that was yeah like that added this extra layer of something else to the blues brothers um which you know although you had John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd as the you know the main protagonists, and they had their um, handful of songs that they did. You know, it's kind of funny to go, okay, these two white boys <laughs> doing these raw, you know, fairly straight down the line, not particularly um, <laughs> thrilling, uh, you know, covers of blues standards. Uh, but I, I guess you're just kind, of, you know, you're just there for the, the you know the comedy value and their total commitment to those characters which um did did they were those characters that was that like was that a saturday night live spin-off did they exist there first saturday night live talk about nostalgia and how saturday saturday night live um occupies sacred cow territory for so many uh, american viewers and american actors and comic actors and stand-ups um and i mean look you can go online and you can find some pretty decent clips but i mean i've never seen and i've never seen a full episode of saturday night live from start to finish um my sense is a lot of it is extremely weak and not that funny at all um but look that's um you know you know this is when this is what we get into like you know sacred cow territory and nostalgia and you know things that you know can't be criticized and people's sort of blind spots because of the the place it occupies in their emotional memory and you know it it it, it, it you know it takes it takes work to go and you know re reappraise or re-examine these things um i mean another you know another childhood favorite of mine and I, I'm, you know, I'm staying away from things like Star Wars, and I'm staying away from things like you know Raiders of the Lost Ark, which in fact stand up really, really well. But another favourite of mine was Clash of the Titans. <laughs> Again, around that 1980-81 mark, with this kind of star-studded 
and you realize now kind of stodgy cast um you know uh Laurence Olivier as as Zeus um and Harry Hamlin as the the kind of the protagonist um Perseus or Perseus and I thought Clash of the Titans was just unbelievably excellent and thrilling and atmospheric and, and kind of epic and the the creatures and the monsters which I think were creations of um, was it Ray Harryhausen the classic sort of model maker of of, of Hollywood movies through the sort of 50s 60s 70s um, and Clash of the Titans may have been one of his you know last kind of great works but again you go back and check out Clash of the Titans now um, it, it's it's pretty stodgy stuff um, that said I haven't watched it in its entirety but I could have watched that endlessly as a, you know eight year old nine year old I just thought this is this is the business <laughs> this is the jam but um yeah, so my daughter, not interested at all in the great race, like just eye rolling and, you know, very conspicuous, uh, performative yawns. And when when can this end? When can I, you know, when have I served, you know, have I served my time yet to your nostalgia trip? Can I leave? Uh, I may try her again, but my, my daughter has a, a real stubborn streak and is um, she's not good at revisiting things. She wasn't a fan either of uh, my wife and I sat down to watch My Fair Lady a few years ago and yeah, couldn't convince my daughter. I think that was our second attempt to watch it with, uh, you know, with my daughter and um, yeah, no, no, thank you. So I don't know. Look, it's an age thing as well, I guess. But yeah, my daughter's funny. She kind of takes an idea that no, this is not for me and she's not for turning. Which is, you know, I, I, I admire that as well. Um, I admire her sort of uh, willfulness, and her feistiness um, and knowing her own mind. Um, but let me just clarify, you know, ch- ch- choosing choosing a film to watch um, isn't without emotion. You know, the stakes are quite high because it's you know it's one of the things i love to do most and my daughter my daughter is also um you know has has become a serious movie watcher and you know we have we have there's battles over what we can watch um and then you know my wife just rolls her eyes she um she comes to sit down and watch a movie very seldom uh, <laughs> so she's just like she has no interest in these these battles of you know what's the best thing for the family to watch and yeah i know i'm the adult okay relax but at the same time i'm like no you need you know sit down let's let's watch this we need to watch this this is you know this is precious time can we please watch something that's decent um and so i'm wondering like you know would my daughter like the blues brothers i i think not and you know it's also a comedy thing as well a comedy you know nothing dates like comedy really um depending on the kind of comedy like it, and it, it's a it's a tonality issue as well um i mean if you regard a movie like 48 hours as a comedy and again when we were young and eddie murphy is singing roxanne in that falsetto in the prison cell Com- comic comedy gold we thought and you know nick nolte being you know tough and uncompromising and a badass and cursing his head off in contrast to um eddie murphy's you know guile and wiliness and you know street smarts and cool blackness They're like this is great this is a great you know this great contrast of, of personalities but you know, you go back, you go back and watch Forty Eight Hours, and like there's a tonality that kind of kind of an eighties, you know, tonality and sensibility that is is jarring and um, feels kind of tone deaf, and 
you know, there's a, I feel like there's a ubiquitous use of the N word, if I recall correctly, that just doesn't sit well nowadays. And there's a kind of a, a sort of a one note um, aspect to, I think, to Nolte's performance in particular, you know, that just isn't that interesting. But I think at the time we were supposed to go, this is, you know, this is comedy. This is really funny stuff. Um, so again, this yeah, that's another eye roller for my wife. She's like, really, forty eight hours? I don't think so. Um, now I haven't, I haven't come to my final conclusion on forty eight hours. I, I think I'll have to rewatch it and uh, report back on my my findings because I know there are elements to that that are are very good. The sort of cop thriller element to it, um, I think, works quite well still. Um, so anyway, so anyway, I was going to say this to come back to the idea of nostalgia. And it's because I was thinking about that, the hurricane when I was a kid. And I was thinking about this thing that I've seen sort of various, um, various versions of of a social media post that does the rounds and what it is fundamentally is someone who is in their 40s or 50s typically just doing this sort of um you know blow by blow generic description of what it was like to be a kid back in the day back in the 70s and the 80s and you know staying out till you know till last light you know being a latchkey kid in a good sense you know having adventures um you know i'm not i I can't even you know bring the specifics of this very generic post to mind but fundamentally what it is is this nostalgia trip and it's a copy and paste job you know this is one of the things i hate about social media when people present something that's you know totally ubiquitous and they present it as you know their little you know their little sort of insightful share um and i just find them i, I find them sort of obnoxious and infuriating and you know cookie cutter generic um and i was trying to kind of put that particular social media posts that I'm referring to into a sort of a, into a context of you know of, of nostalgia and go like what is it why doesn't that work or why does it you know why does it you know rankle with me so much and what I was thinking was that basically what that is it's a generalized nostalgia so it's you know it, it, you know it's fundamentally like you know, AI vomiting up a little nostalgia piece, a little sepia toned, um, you know, a sepia toned reminiscence, you know, for everyone to go, ah, oh, do you remember when, do you remember when we wore those and wore them and we thought, and this, we thought this was that and that was this and a computer was like this and I just go, I just find it so extraordinarily unoriginal. And therefore, it has no interest whatsoever. And I look at that and I think about the person who posted it. And I'm just, I just kind of scratch my head and go, tell me your own thought. Share your own memory. Give me your own personal nostalgia trip. And paint that picture for me. Because that's interesting. Um, but the reproduction of the mass-produced soundbite uh, is is disgusting. <laughs> and, um, it just makes me want to, you know, throw the uh, you know whatever device I'm 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 looking at it on. I, I want to throw the device as far from myself as possible. And that side of social media is just it's the worst. It really is. And 
when I give out, when I give out and, and whinge and moan about a certain type of wellness content that is regurgitated constantly in online spaces, you know, it, that's in a similar territory. Like that is in a similar territory with people just reproducing, you know, certain ideas and um, tenets of, of wellness in a very generic mass produced way and putting it in a nice you know in a nice post with a nice visual um and getting the likes <laughs> and i just go will you get the hell out of here with this get the hell out of here with this this contributes nothing these are just platitudes um you know this just they're just a pablum of of wellness puree you know it's 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 baby food you know for people who don't <laughs> excuse me for people who don't want to use their teeth uh on chewing into the real issues of wellness um because that requires work you know wellness is a product of work real work real graft real self-examination real negotiation and, and that's why like real wellness you, you know that's why so many people are not well because they don't want to do the work because it's bloody terrifying and having to face yourself is terrifying and face the crap you, you know you spend your life trying to avoid it's 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 scary um so instead i'll just you know i'll just position myself as someone who's got things sussed out and here's a picture of a butterfly, you know, hovering above a field of flowers and some quote from, I don't know, Eckhart Tolle or, you know, whoever it might be. And I mean, there's always been, I mean, there's always been that aspect, I, I, you know, to um, a certain sector or a certain presentation of, of sort of self-care slash wellness slash positive psychology. I think there's always been an element of, of quackery to it, um, you know, of a sort of this, this kind of placebo effect of having someone go, here, these are the answers. This will help you feel blah, 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 insert whatever, you know, you want to feel. And now, and da, 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 da. Um, and look, you know, do you begrudge those people you know positioning themselves in that role not really you know if people are going to just go along and you know believe it or swallow it whole wholesale without really doing their own work you know they're kind of made for each other I suppose um, anyway look that's um, that, that wasn't necessarily where I wanted to go with this um but I'm trying to think. I'm trying. What I'm trying to identify is the idea of nostalgia as being as being something that is very natural on some level, and I think it's connected to very deep emotions and probably very connected to a sense of loss and therefore and therefore connected to um, regret um, but it, there's something I think there's something inherently painful about nostalgia and because it's it, it, it's it's this sort of sentimentalization of of the past and of particular aspects of the past and of course it's connected to aging um, and that, that was one very successful, uh, one very successful joke in 
the Inside Out sequel, Inside Out 2, where you're basically looking at the inside of a 12 year old girl's you know, mind and her emotional um, you know, personifications of her emotional state and where her head's at and what the impact is on her identity, her personality, her sense of self. And twice or three times in the uh, the uh, kind of control room of the, of the mind, a door would open and this little old sort of granny character would, would shuffle in and go, oh, I remember when. And she'd just be quickly, you know, shouted out of the room like, no, too soon, too soon. Um, but, you know, kids, you know, <laughs> kids are capable of nostalgia as well. Um you know, it's it, it's it, I I observe it in my daughter who is fast approaching eleven, and there's something about you know a kid being aware of the passing of time and aware of earlier memories and how that strikes them. Um, you know, it, it's potent stuff. See, memory is potent, and 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 memory holds so much of our of our journey and our our growth and our understanding of ourselves and you know memories which get locked in 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 you know you know in a certain part of 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 the past and in a certain part of how we kind of conceive of ourselves they have more power um and it's i think as well there's you know there's there's another element to this which i think is sensory you know the idea of certain tastes sounds sights smells textures that can be incredibly um stimulating and evocative um I don't know where I was somewhere the other day. Um I just got a I just got this kind of nostalgia rush of certain sort of geometric plastic geometric shapes that were um different colored but they were sort of tra- they were transparent um, or translucent and they'd fit into each other. And I just got a flash of the different colors. And I and I've, I've I've personally I have this very strong response to colours, and a sele- <laughs> just like a child, you know, a selection of the same things <laughs> with vivid colours, like in like crayons, uh, um, you know, you know, like you know, pencils or or, or sharpeners. And you know, I it, I get relocated to to primary school, or maybe even pre, you know, before primary school, and just the, the, the you know the range of appealing, colourful objects and things that were there for us to play with. Uh, <laughs> so I still, you know, I still kind of have this relationship to colour where I'll it you know it ignites something it turns on a light in me um but I don't then you know yearn to be back in you know the primary school classroom that's not the uh, that's not the objective um but yeah I I think um The way I'm trying to sort of understand this is, you know, on that idea of of yearning. I think there is there is a connection between um, a present sense of of loss or a present sense of less than or a present sense of lack that perhaps nudges us in the in the direction of 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 recollection 
and reminiscence and you know for me you know when i'm in you know when i'm experiencing you know those things the sense of hmm something's not here that used to be here i do find myself you know rewinding the tape and in a way it's to sort of it's to kind of check in and go is my memory correct did i imagine that and that's you know, that, that that's not nostalgia like that's looking back and kind of going hmm that was very different to now and i liked it <laughs> in a way that i don't like now <laughs> um and again it that might be just the most unbelievably mundane observation and you might be listening going yeah it's called getting older and you know the the what god what's the expression the bloom the bloom the the the, oh the bloom goes off the the flower oh there's a yeah you know what i'm trying to say it's like life just isn't as beautiful as it once was (laughs) and you know, there, there's there seems to be a theme in the you know in in recent episodes where I'm kind of I'm negotiating, you know, looking at you know midlife and going okay, how do I proceed? How do I move on from now? Um, because ultimately, that would be one of my wellness beliefs. You know, which is all that really counts is how you respond now and it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what's gone before in the sense of there's no value in living in the past or you know relitigating the past you know particular you know your past grievances and hurts and resentments and and traumas you can understand them there's nothing wrong with that and that's work that's worth doing and you know many of us need to do that work in professional settings Um, but I think all that really counts is how you go forward what is your response to the understanding you have at the present moment? What is your response to your, you know, your 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 current station? Um, I mean, if you want to be very linear and go, you know, you're moving through life. You know, is life a straight line? Is the journey from the cradle to the grave a straight line? Is it one long advance to to your final moment? Um, I'm sure there's a million physicists um, or quantum physicists or quantum whatever the hell they are, uh, <laughs> quantum experts who would assure me that it's not a straight line. Um, but as I have said in in an earlier episode, it's like, look, you know, it it's like a, there's a dissonance. You know, you can have, <laughs> you can sit, you can sit me down, and you can give me the you know the quantum physics lesson, and explain you know relativity and you know make me rewatch Oppenheimer, um, you know whatever whatever needs to be done, and to a certain extent, I'll go, oh yeah, okay. I get it. I understand. Oh, um, yeah, that scientific muscle in my brain has been well and well and truly worked out. But then I'll just come, I'll just go back to hey, <laughs> tomorrow's another day closer to the end. I'm still moving along this track. Uh, I'm still moving along the conveyor belt of life, uh, and you know I, I you know what's going to change what's going to change my you know, how i understand the journey 
you know, what, what's going to change that substantively enough to really rewire my thinking? Um, I'm not sure. And I, you know, and I, and I am truly speaking for myself. I, I don't know what, you know, what your own process is or how you understand the passage of time or if that weighs on you or, or stresses you out. Um, you know, I, I'm probably finding myself from you know the first time in my life thinking about you know time that's left and what can be done and and yeah and and what has been done and what hasn't been done uh, and what could have been done <laughs> and what should have been done perhaps um, but in a way it's like it's all just it's all academic it's all hypothetical and again i come back to look choices choices and other people's choices and other circumstances and other random things you know all these different elements have brought us to this moment you know where you know wherever you are listening to this you know choices your choices, the choice of, you know, the choices of the, the people in your in your life um, and many, many other things and many, many other things, you know, millions of other things that are completely out of your control have led you to here now. Um, and it's the same for me. It's the same for everyone. And all we have all we have is a decision making capacity and a certain amount of you know critical reasoning you know with which to help us make our next move um and that's about it there's very little else and in a way, that should be something that's quite heartening, I think. There's a, there's a real simplicity um, to that. And, like, you know, I know as, as someone who probably spends way too much time in his head, um, you know, it, it's easy to get lost in, you know, over-analysis and, you know, hyper reflection <laughs> and you know when those things are given the rocket fuel of stress or anxiety they truly can be overwhelming they can completely dominate the screen and i continue to try to cultivate the ability to clear the screen and to calm things down and to reduce things to something elemental and irreducible and solid um, and that might be that might be just something like you know uh, you know as as um as obvious within a wellness context it, it might be something as obvious as just focusing on the next breath it might be something as obvious as focusing on something that's in my line of vision and trying to bring to bear on that one thing every ounce of my concentration it might just be feeling the weight of my body where I stand, where I sit, where I lie and allowing gravity to descend and bring me back down to earth or make me feel heavier than I am. You know, this sort of sensory, perceptive, you know, magic that the mind can, can wield. Uh, to add weight to 
this space I occupy, this mass. And sometimes that's the that's the strategy. That's the that's the strategy of of calming down. And yes, it is mindfulness. Um, and as I said before, you know, one of my interpretations of mindfulness is attention with intention. And I'm definitely going through um, a bit of a free falling, chaotic moment in my in my life currently, and I was trying to articulate the you know the primary um, the primary sort of reference points to help me stabilize and. I was laying them out for a friend today, actually, over a coffee. Um, I also communicated it to another friend via a text message. But basically, I was saying the, you know, the, the main issues are work and purpose and clarity and intention and action. So work, purpose, clarity intention action it's kind of a little mantra isn't it and i was you know i was what confessing <laughs> you know when you, when you confess something it's always like an admission of frailty or, or weakness or, or guilt but i was confessing that none of those things feel within my reach at the moment um, and maybe this is just on the back of moving house and the the energetic upheaval uh, that comes with that, the, the you know the energetic disruption and the I you know, I suppose a kind of an, an energetic distress from from leaving a place that had you know a lot of memories. Um, Again, will I look back with nostalgia <laughs> at the place at hashtag blessed? You know, in some ways, perhaps. Um, but in other ways, you know, it was good. It was good to close that chapter. It was good to come to hashtag, hashtag whatever this place is, hashtag secret garden, hashtag drive by, hashtag Elwood's place. Hashtag, it ain't much, but it's home. Um, yeah. So, I think, um, you, know, you know, as is so often the case, if it sounds like I'm giving advice, <laughs> if it sounds like I'm offering counsel, believe me, I'm, I'm advising myself and I'm offering it to myself. And... The communication of these, you know, wellness negotiations, and the communication of, you know, aspects of my own personal excavation. Um, uh, you know, I believe I continue to believe that there's a benefit in doing that, not just for myself, but for for you, the listener. <laughs> Even if the benefit is to clarify. That you completely disagree with me i mean that's that's beneficial you know knowing what you think there's a there's a there's a strength in that um you know we, we don't have to give ourselves over constantly to you know interpretation and relativity um and i don't mean einstein's relativity but you know when we when we relativize everything you know, I find that's a, I find that's a bit of a bit of a cop out. Um, you know, everything depends on something else. Everything. You know, everything has its own kind of, contextual factors or or elements. Um, it's very easy just to avoid naming the thing when we do that. Um, it doesn't suit me. It doesn't suit me. It it suits some people. I think it allows I think some people enjoy the 
the space that gives them to be apparently uh, more tolerant, more forgiving, more radically accepting, I suppose. Um, if you hear a note of skepticism in my voice, that's because there is one. <laughs> <laughs> you know we all listen we're all doing what we can to survive we're all doing what we can to not lose our minds um and for the umpteenth millionth time this is a spiky time we're living in um it's a scary time it's a time that is fraught with anxiety and i mean that was you know, it was one of the reasons I started the podcast um, to try and put something out there that was positive and yeah sure calming and um, yeah it's look you know it's not for me to say uh, I know what it does for me um, I don't always know what it does for you but every now and again uh, and actually I had, had a lovely lovely uh, coffee today with I have a lot of friends called Dave <laughs> and you know quite a few of them are actors but uh, I was with my friend Dave the actor today we had a lovely coffee and a great chat and um, yeah he's a he's he's a listener to the to the podcast so how are you Dave if you're listening and it was very um, validating and affirming for me to hear some of his thoughts on the podcast and, and what he gets from them so um so hey be like dave <laughs> reach out say something nice because that's nice it's okay to be nice you know there's a there's real generosity of spirit uh in being nice to others um and that is its own its own reward that's a that's like a, a self radiator but just don't get sanctimonious about it don't start thinking you're great <laughs> just be nice and move on just enjoy the moment and then you can go back to being you know however you were before okay listen that's it um sorry that was that was probably a little bit rambly tonight um but do yourself a favor go and go and watch go and watch the great race the blues brothers and blazing saddles and and get back to me and you know between us maybe we can maybe we can convince my daughter that they are they are worth uh enshrining <laughs> as comedy classics that will stand the test of time um yeah maybe not anyway okay i will end this and i'll blow out my candle and i will talk to you very soon thank you so much for listening i hope you got something from this if you feel like it, you can throw me some love on dreaded social media. The Clear Out podcast is on Instagram and Facebook and for the time being still on YouTube. Uh, you can email me at theclearoutlive at gmail.com. And if you really think this is something valuable, something precious, you can support me with a monthly donation using the patreon link that's patreon.com forward slash the clear out and for the price of i mean this is just going to change i was just listening to how expensive ireland is um absolutely depressing so for the you know for the price of half a cup of coffee um or half a sandwich or a very small bar of chocolate you can support this independent podcast uh, and help me keep on rocking in the free world okay thank you for listening mind yourselves don't get blown away by hurricane ernesto uh, i will talk to you soon i'll be back next week with something different take care all the best bye